Jesus. <laughs> we have all this technology, so we're using it. They they didn't have. All they exactly. had was you know, apples falling from trees or whatever. Confirming gravity. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, that's Anit Maya. Today I'm doing something different, very interesting. I visited ICR today, the Institute of Cancer Research in London, and I'm going to meet amazing people who are doing great work <laughs> in cancer research. I am going to uh, be interviewing Dr. Lauren. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she has done a lot of uh, videos regarding cancer research, STEM. She's a STEMinist. Some of you are feminists? Feminists? She's a STEMinist. <laughs> STEMinist, if that word exists. So, um, thank you so much for creating this time. Very welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to learning so much from you and, you know, getting so many stories being passed on to the young girls who have been still. So, uh, could you please introduce yourself yeah, to the viewers? Yeah, of course. So, hi, uh, my name is Lauren Yeomans, uh, Dr. Lauren Yeomans. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I recently actually last year passed my viva and uh, graduated this year from my PhD and I now work as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute of Cancer Research here in London. Oh wow, that's great. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, finishing your PhD takes a lot. It takes a village. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great, so um, could you just um, take us through your education journey, what you did and where your bachelor's, master's and PhD. I think you briefly mentioned that about yeah. this, but you know, it would be good to know like how it was. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So my my journey was actually a bit of a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. um, so I did my undergrad, my BSc at Manchester, which mm -hmm. was in physics with philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, I then actually moved out of education and worked in finance for a little while because I sort of thought, well, I just need to earn some money. You know, as you do <laughs> as a student, you're like, you know, it's time, it's time to not be a student anymore. Um, but within a year or so of that, I thought, I miss physics, you know, like I miss, <laughs> I miss learning um, and sort of challenging myself. So I applied to a master's degree at UCL, mm -hmm. um, which was in advanced high energy physics, so mm -hmm. um, particle physics. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a year long. And then I went on to do my PhD at the University of Liverpool, mm -hmm. uh, which was based on the LHCB experiment at CERN in Switzerland. LSEB? Um, LHCB. LHCB, so, what's that? So it's the Large Hadron Collider UT experiment. Oh. So at the Large Hadron Collider, there are four main detectors mm. on the on the ring. So the ring fires protons around and then they get them to collide within these four detectors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the one I was working on was called LHCB. Oh. Yeah, so I did that for four years. Um, mm. And then... Yeah, graduated this year. Congratulations. And moved on to the postdoc here at ICR. <laughs> it's so interesting how you went to finance after your bachelor's. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a yeah, crazy turn. But I think I needed that to realise what I wanted to do. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think if I had stayed and, you know, carried on in education, I might have thought, mm. oh maybe I should try something else. Mm, yeah. I'm glad that I sort of went there, did that for mm. a year and thought, nope. Mm. <laughs> I have to go back. But, yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. What uh, drove you to do science? What inspired you to do science? I have loved physics, like, ever since being a child, you know. It was basically the, uh, what drove me towards physics was the curiosity about like the universe mm. in general and what the universe is made of and all that kind of thing. So mm. I ended up doing actually my undergrad degree was at Manchester and it was in physics with philosophy. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of tackling the, the big questions of the universe from both perspectives, like the, the physical sense and the philosophical sense. Um, and then, yeah, during my undergrad, I realized I was really interested in sort of particle physics, the very small, Mm -hmm. um, and discovering what the universe is ultimately made of. 
Um, so I did my PhD in high energy physics, mm. um, out based out at CERN in Switzerland. And yeah, then from that point, um, I loved my PhD and I had a great time, but I did sort of feel like I wasn't really helping anyone <laughs> with what I was doing. So it was really fun and, um, you know, sort of, yeah, it was great for the curiosity side of things. But then mm. I thought, okay, I've got the skill set. Mm, what yeah. can I do to apply it to, mm. um, you know, helping people in yeah. everyday life? So, yeah, took a bit of a change into the sort of medical realm and mm. um, cancer research. Yeah, mm. I mean, uh, sometimes you might do things and be like, oh, I don't think that I'm helping anybody, but I have a feeling that your energy can never go to waste. No. <laughs> so then, you might not know if you'd applied, but one time abruptly, oh wait, I think I would know I've studied about this. I can apply it here. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, you learn so much that mm. you can um, put into anything that you want. Really, I think if you're doing some kind of STEM focused field, you can mm. then you just have a skill set that you can apply to a lot of different areas. Mm. Mm. Science. Yeah. When you say that you did um, physics and philosophy, I was like, wait, wait, wait. How do those two combine? Mm. I truly couldn't try to pull those things together. Could you just tell us how those two come together? Because like, yeah. philosophy is in art. If I'm not wrong, physics is science. How do those two come together? Well, I always thought it was a bit of a shame that they were separated in the first place. So mm. if you look back to like ancient philosophers, Mm. and physicists and you know like Galileo even was a philosopher in a sense and he was a physicist and I think all of the very early um sort of records that we have are of people looking at the universe looking at the stars looking at everything and trying to figure it all out right mm -hmm. and you could do that from a physics sense mm -hmm. and you can also do it from a philosophical sense so I always found that so interesting when studying philosophy that there was a lot of physics involved and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously now, as you said, they're, they're very separate things, but mm -hmm. I think the way of thinking mm -hmm. um, is very similar. And ultimately they're trying to answer the same questions, mm -hmm. but in a different way. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, the course itself was quite separate. It was physics and then it was philosophy, but we mm. did do some really interesting modules on the philosophy of time mm. Um, mm. and physics and reality and all those things that I think the more you learn in physics, the more you realize you actually don't know. And philosophy might actually have the answers that you're mm. looking for. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They do mesh together quite well, ultimately. <laughs> I'm so happy you explored this. Mm -hmm. The question that I want to ask is not related to this, but do you believe or think that those, you know, ancient philosophers or people, you know, of long time ago were smarter than us? I think they... It's, it's hard to know because we have a lot more at our fingertips. So we have technology that mm. they didn't have. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, it's hard it's yeah it's hard to know what smarter means in a sense mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they can ap they applied their brains in a certain way to certain problems and mm -hmm, come up with a solution mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. there's always these sort of paradigm shifts over history mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, what they believed at the time we've now as a as humanity come mm -hmm. to understand that perhaps that's not correct you know mm -hmm, but, um, mm -hmm how the universe works and mm. the sun being the center or the earth being the center <laughs> and all of that, you know. Um, Blood or succulent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, mm. you might look back on people who thought the earth was the center of the universe and think, wow, <laughs> they, they weren't smart. But, mm. you know, at the time mm. they were, it was all about critical thinking and trying mm. to figure things out. Mm. Oh, I love that because, <laughs> you know, sometimes I feel like we are using, I mean, using all those laws from Newton and all those people, we are still using those, we are applying those laws. I'm mm. like, these people are only smart. They didn't have technology. Yeah. They were smart. But then, oh, we're also smart. We are discovering new drugs for 
concern. You know, we are yeah. having advanced technology, building great buildings and all that yeah. stuff. I mean, you work within the space you've got, right? So mm. we have all this technology, so we're using it. They mm. they didn't have, all they exactly. had was, you know, apples falling from trees. Or whatever. <laughs> Confirming gravity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Great. What um, did you like most, you know, when you were at your undergraduate? Undergraduate feels like quite a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> there are, I mean, some moments you can never forget, or some moments or instances yeah. you can be like, oh, I'll never forget that thing. There was definitely one um, moment. So we had to do labs as mm. part of our physics undergrad. Mm. Um, and one of them was a study of um, the movement of Jupiter. I think it was something to do with the movement of Jupiter. Anyway, mm. we ended up not really doing that, but there was a micro, um, sorry, a telescope on the roof of the Schuster Building in Manchester, oh. um, which is like the physics department. Mm. And instead of going to lab during the day, like everyone else was doing their undergrad, we went at night. So when it got dark, we'd go up to the telescope mm. and we'd take um, videos of Jupiter and then mm. as a side project we ended up taking lots of different videos of the moon mm. um, and then compressing them into images of really high quality and then stitching them together and we ended up with this amazing high definition image of the moon and that's one thing that I'll always oh, I'll always wow. remember from my undergrad because yeah I've still got the picture um, wow. and yeah that was a pretty amazing thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Where you able to see the Jupiter? What's that? Jupiter. 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 Jupiter? Who oh, Jupiter? <laughs> <so sad>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did you find me? Like, I thought you were asking about a software, a piece of software, <laughs> and I was like, I don't think I've heard of it. <laughs> No, because you wanted to take Jupiter and then ended up taking pictures of the moon, right? Yeah. Those two are different. So I don't things. really remember mm. what we did with Jupiter, <laughs> to be honest. But I just, yeah, the thing about the moon was the thing that stuck with me. Okay. And I think it was some sort of analysis of, of the movement of Jupiter. Mm. I, I'm not sure we really succeeded on that part of the lab. But mm. yeah, we were proud of ourselves for the. Uh, the yeah, image that we great got. pictures <laughs> of the moon. Yeah. And was there anything you never liked or any really bad experience you encountered while doing your bachelor's? Um, I don't know if there was anything really bad. I mean, there were certain labs that I didn't really enjoy, but mm. again, they didn't really stick in my memory. Mm. Um, there are always going to be certain parts. I think when you're at undergrad still at that level you don't get to specialize as much as you would like you know mm. there's things you have to do yeah um and we had to do all of the core physics modules and there were certain you know labs about electricity and things which I just, mm. you know, didn't yeah, really interest me that much mm. um but yeah you still gotta still gotta <laughs> do them so but yeah I don't remember anything being particularly no Great. You don't let those things to be rent free in your head. Yeah. There exactly. were a lot of interesting let things to be in there. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um your master, did you do a master's in at UCL, right? Yeah. Yes. So how was that? That was a very steep learning curve mm. because I had done my undergrad and then I had gone up out of education mm. for a little while mm. and then I'd come back and I was basically following the first year of the PhD students mm. at UCL mm. so it was very research driven we did have some sort of taught classes right at the beginning mm. um, which a lot of places do mm. now as part of the PhD just a couple of refreshers mm. um, but yeah a lot of it was just learning myself you know I didn't know how to code at that point mm. and everything was, you know, C++ coding. So I had to learn very quickly. Um, yeah, oh basically teach myself how to do a lot of stuff in order to get to the level that I had to be at. Mm. Um, 
so yeah, it was a very steep learning curve and it was only a year. Mm. So I felt like by the time I'd got to grips with it, it was over. <laughs> um, <laughs> so but, quick. Yeah, it was really interesting and it definitely cemented my um, sort of interest in in physics. And I thought, okay, yeah, I've got to carry mm. on. I've got to do a PhD now because I've sort of just got that momentum going mm. and then all of a sudden it was over. So, mm. um, wow. Yeah. Um, I have this question. Um, you you did coding, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, but where do you apply coding in high energy beams? So it's basically data analysis. So uh -huh. the protons collide in the middle of the detector mm. and you get a load of data coming out from various sub detectors. Mm -hmm. um, but each person, each group within the collaboration is looking for a very particular thing. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for a very rare decay. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to find that, you've got to look at all of this data, filter through it all mm -hmm. somehow, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, find it. So basically, you have to learn how to code because you have to be able to perform analysis on all of the data. Um, to cut out what you don't want and include what you do want and use boosted decision trees and sort of oh, mach machine wow. learning techniques and all sorts in order to find what you're looking for. So wow, I never knew that it's an apply coding in data <laughs> analysis. Now I know. <laughs> and uh, did you think about doing your PhD right away when you were at your master's degree or you so I actually didn't. I actually had another year in between those two. Mm. because as I said with the masters it was very much a um, very steep learning curve at the beginning I wasn't sure I was cut out for research to mm. be honest I wasn't mm. sure that I wasn't sure I was going to enjoy it mm. um, and yeah here in the UK anyway you sort of have to start applying for your PhDs by like before Christmas October yeah. November mm. and I'd only just started my masters at that mm. point mm. Um, so I decided to wait, mm, um, mm. yeah, do the masters and then decide mm. if I wanted to do a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, so after my masters, I actually did a year in teacher training. Mm -hmm. So I did a PGCE um, postgraduate certificate in education and mm. became a qualified secondary school teacher oh. um, of science. Mm. So yeah, at the time, I just thought, what's something that I can do that's going to be beneficial in the long term? Mm. It's going to keep me in physics. Um, yeah, I just wanted to do something for that, that year. Because mm. by that time, I decided I did want to do a PhD. Mm. Um, and obviously, that's always something I can do now in the future, teaching mm. if if I decide that yeah. oh, that's great. something I want to go back to. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, you have equipped yourself with a lot of skills that you can do various jobs. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Just kept doing degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what did you work on for your PhD? Um, so my PhD was, as I, like I mentioned it briefly, but it was a very rare decay at mm. LHCB. Mm. That's a, Switzerland. So yeah, it, mm. it, in Switzerland. So I was based between the University of Liverpool and Switzerland. Mm. Um, I lived out there for a year and then just traveled back and forth mm. uh, for the mm. rest of the time. Mm. And yeah, so the whole, the whole purpose of CERN as a whole was to try and figure out the standard model of particle physics, which mm. is just basically all the very fundamental particles that we mm. have in the universe and mm. what makes up, what are those tiny building blocks that make up everything. Um, and we have quite a good picture of it, but mm. there's still some bits that are missing. Mm. So, so complicated. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. So we're trying to, yeah, just figure out the interactions between all of the particles and, mm. you know, you know, what happened at the mm. Big Bang and <laughs> yeah. everything like that, like how, how the universe began and mm. how it all works you know what dark matter is and dark energy and there's just so many big questions that we mm. still yeah. haven't figured out the answers to mm. um even gravity we talked earlier about isaac yeah. newton it's, we don't understand how that works still <laughs> yeah. and it's one of the most fundamental um, yeah, everyone forces knows. everyone yeah. knows about it but no one knows 
why or how mm. it works. So, um, yeah, all these big questions and you end up doing something very particular when you're doing your PhD mm. because mm. there's obviously huge teams, thousands Definitely. of people working at CERN. Mm. Um, and I was looking for, yeah, one very particular um, decay of a B meson, mm. um, which, yeah, very uh, specific. But ultimately, if we had found that that was sort of the rate of that decay was outside of the standard model prediction, mm -hmm. then that would have helped us to say, okay, well, if it isn't something we already know, what is it? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it turned out to be within the standard model oh, prediction. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah. Sort of good in that we know we've, we've got some things right, but also at the moment everyone's trying to break that standard model so that we can figure out what it is, mm. what else we have, because yeah. you know, we know we don't have the full picture. Mm. So. And that's how it works. Mm. What mm. was the hardest thing throughout your PhD? Um, I mean, there's so, there's so many challenges. One of the big things for me was always um, coding because Mm. you use code as a tool to do what you want to do mm. but quite often it doesn't work the way that you want it to do and you can spend days debugging a piece of code that you've mm. written mm. to find out that it, you've put an extra semicolon somewhere and mm. you just think <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I want to do this <laughs> <laughs> but then when it works it's so mm. satisfying that you think okay it is worth it Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's loads of things like that, and every, everyone that works in high energy physics has had days or weeks like that where, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're writing a specific part of code that doesn't work, mm -hmm. and you just have sat there thinking, why, 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 and then it just comes to you, and you're like, oh, that's why, <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, oh, it's easy. <laughs> um, yeah, but there's there's so many other things you know? so many challenges you know mm. you're, you're working with people who um over covid especially you're working we were working mm. online like a big collaboration but then like our smaller team was like 10 of us but we had people in italy we had people who had young children that weren't at school because of covid and mm. you know it's just you know a lot to organize but yeah we managed to get through it luckily yeah <laughs> Well, what do you wish you would have done in your first year? Of my PhD? Yes. Mm. In terms of academic or outside, in terms of you know, non-academic responsibilities and all of that. Yeah, so one thing that I regretted not doing was mm. teaching at university level. Mm. Because normally in your first year of your PhD or or, you know, throughout your PhD, you get the opportunity to work with undergrads mm -hmm. um, in, you know, workshops. You don't normally do lecturing, but you do like workshops and mm -hmm. um, tutorials and that kind of thing. And those, the applications to start getting into the teaching process were mm -hmm. quite early on. And again, I thought, well, let's just get my get settled down with, uh, you mm. know, doing the research first. Something. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of missed out on that, which was a bit of a shame because they had then so many people that wanted to teach that, mm. you know, the lists were full and mm. they didn't need anyone else. Um, so I did get very involved with, like, outreach in, in other ways, mm. uh, which was great. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, the teaching thing, I would have quite enjoyed that, I think. Mm. I was a bit scared at the time that I wouldn't, manage i wouldn't know the answers to be honest that's what scared me i thought what if i'm in what if i'm doing like a quantum physics tutorial and i don't know what the answer is like, um mm. but yeah obviously you figure it out as you go but um yeah i wish i could have done that <laughs> i i really you know I, i'm sorry that you missed that because you know honestly when i'm learning something i always love it if i have that opportunity to teach it to other people because you understand it more mm -hmm. and you know I'm, I'm trying my best probably in my second year to find a way of you know uh, getting you know something that I can do 
with undergraduate with undergrad yes you know teach them something that um i'm working on yeah yeah that's what i really want yeah yeah i found that in my when i was doing my um secondary school teaching qualification i thought you know i was teaching a level physics and i thought at the time i found this really hard and now teaching it makes it so much easier to yeah, understand yeah, yeah 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 so you actually give yourself um yeah you sort of benefit yourself by by teaching other people but, mm-hmm. yeah i also find it interesting if students ask me difficult questions that yeah. i haven't thought about yeah exactly yeah i'll say yeah but you're helping me expand my understanding yeah thank you i'm so lucky i'm here mm. yeah <laughs> okay yeah, great definitely. Great. What were the major lessons you learned while doing your PhD? Um, how to be organised, <laughs> because I think doing a PhD, like organisation is so key. Mm. Um, you've got several different things going on at once normally, mm. and you have to learn to sort of prioritise. Mm. Um, also in my PhD, I had to learn how to say no to people which mm. was quite a big lesson for me because mm. I'm used to just saying, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, people, my supervisor at the time said to me, you have to say no because otherwise people will just assume that you have the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you don't do it well or something like that, then you'll, you know, it reflects badly on you. Whereas mm, if yeah. you say no, mm. like, I actually don't have time to do that. Mm. I'm really sorry. Or I'd love to do it, but... I won't be able to start until next it's week. Mm-hmm. Um, then people actually respect it, respect you for saying that. And um, yeah, I definitely learned to be less scared of saying no. <laughs> <laughs> Some people always want to say yes, 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 mm-hmm. yes, because they think that if they say no, the other person is going to get mad. But actually, that's not the case. Most people, they understand how busy everybody is. Exactly. So, yeah, so young people... Come on, say no if you can. Yeah. Or just postpone it if you want to do it. And you have time. Hmm. <laughs> At what point did you decide that you wanted to be in academia or in industry? So, interestingly, I don't think I ever made that decision consciously. Oh. Okay. I don't think I ever thought this or that. Mm-hmm. I just, every single stage of my career, mm hasn't necessarily been planned like I don't I I tend to do what interests me most (laughs) at the time um so I'm not very good for like long-term career planning Planning. because I just tend to think okay well I find that interesting so I'm going to do it Mm. you know the thing I love about research and the reason why I think that I'm still in it is because you're always learning Mm. you're always there's always something new for you mm. to go out and mm-hmm. and figure out and mm-hmm. you know it's right on the cutting edge of you know discovery mm-hmm. um, of human knowledge and mm. I think I mean I'm, I suppose you get opportunities for research in industry but mm. I, th- I feel like it's more in industry it's more you do what you know and mm. you get paid for it and then you go home kind mm. of thing. so mm-hmm. I mean I, d- I don't know because I haven't, I haven't done that but <laughs> It's great that, you know, whatever you plan to do, I mean, I mean, if you have it planned, it's also okay, but I mean, um, I'm happy that whatever you wanted to do, you've done it and you've succeeded. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Because, Just you know, as long as you're happy. Play year what, by year. <laughs> <laughs> that's what matters. Take opportunities as they come. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Perfect. So how, do, how did you uh, secure your... PhD position. I think. Do you think we should talk about that? I, I don't mind. I mean, to be honest, I don't really know how. I, I only applied for one, mm-hmm. and, <laughs> and you got that, it, and I got it, which, like, yeah, I guess was very lucky at the time. Oh. Um, so, it was good that I already had a lot of experience in. Mm. I already had experience in CERN, mm. and that was what I wanted to do. Mm. I'd already taught myself how to. Code. Code. I already knew the basics of research because I followed that first mm. year of the UCL PhD. Mm. Mm. So, um, yeah, I was in quite a good position. I lived in Manchester at the time. Mm. I wanted to stay mm. around the north, and I saw mm. this <laughs> saw this p- position in Liverpool, and I was like, okay, I'm mm. going to go for that one. So, yeah, 
luck and um, good timing, I guess. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've applied to Limit Me One, two, three. I think about four PhD positions, yeah. And I've missed those three, I think, yeah, and I wrote one, which mm. I'm doing now. Yeah. It What's always the... works out though, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, finally. Yeah. As long as you don't give up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it, rejection hurts, but then you're like, oh, let me check this. And then you get something that makes you happy and you're like, oh my god, yeah. why was I thinking about all the other ones? This is the best thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think is the hardest thing when you are looking for um post education positions? Now you're postdoc, right? Mm. What's the hardest thing when you are in that process? I think at this point everything is so specialized and that's that's quite hard mm. because you have a you have a specialism so my my phd specialism at the time was um you know lhcb mm. rare decays mm. um and i think sometimes hiring managers look for people who they know can do the job mm. so they look for people with experience mm. in the, the specific software that you're using, etc. Mm. Mm. Um, I think I was very, very fortunate here with mm. ICR that I, I decided I wanted to go into cancer research and I applied for this position mm. and my, um, my manager here was very, I would say open-minded in that mm. he knew I had skills mm. that I could transfer mm. and he knew you know that I'd, I'd worked hard and that I could do x y and z but mm. I didn't have any specific cancer knowledge mm. or uh, medical physics knowledge mm. um, so the fundamentals of x-rays yeah I know that because mm. it's you know it's it's particle physics it's photons mm. um, but I didn't necessarily yeah, know how that translated into cancer research or anything like that. So mm. I was very lucky that he sort of took a chance on me in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, ended up doing what I'm doing now. So again, it's been another steep learning curve because there's mm. lots of different um, new things. New things, but mm. that's, what, that's what I love about it. You know. But that's that's as well interesting because it's also boring if every person in your lab is a biologist. Yeah, yeah we're working on cancer, but you need physicists, you know, yeah. to apply those, you know, uh, those, you know, uh, great, you know, ideas from physics to biology. Yeah, because biology is solved by chemistry, physics, yeah. and all other things outside science. Yeah, you definitely so, need like the cross disciplinary exactly. teams. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I don't think that it was luck. You needed you. <laughs> Maybe. What are some of the shocks you have faced in academia? <clears throat> shocks? Mm -hmm. Or things you never expected in academia? I don't know if there are any. <laughs> okay. Do you have any? Not yet, because I haven't been in academia for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say there's anything that's particularly shocking shocking no okay it's all quite chill <laughs> <laughs> and now um what do you do what are you working on so i'm working at the minute in radiation research mm. um so i'm looking into a new radiotherapy technique mm -hmm. um which involves a delivery of x-rays in in a way that hasn't been done before in the clinic um, so instead of delivering a homogeneous field, so mm -hmm. a, a field where the X-ray energy is the same at all points, mm. um, we're delivering almost like a grid of very high um, energy mm. and then very low energy, sort of peaks and troughs oh, of, okay. of X-rays, mm. um, which hopefully um, and according to the literature has a tissue sparing effect, mm. so mm -hmm. it doesn't affect the healthy tissue mm -hmm. um, as much as normal radiotherapy would in, in cancer treatment. Oh, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> Kill the tumour, save the normal tissue. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, when you said you were working on a new radiotherapy technique, what went to my mind was flush. Yes. Yeah, so we are also going to be looking at flash microbeams. Mm -hmm. um, but at the minute, yeah, we're looking more at the 
spatial separation mm. um, as opposed to like ultra high dose rates. Mm -hmm. And then once we, if we can see the micro beam effect, we can then look at the flash effect with the micro beam effect. Wow. Perfection. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you would like to tell your young self? Not any girl who wants to do science or physics. Mm. I have always said, like, I've, I've always very much been, like, maybe it's selfish, but if I'm interested in something, I want to do it, then I'll do it, mm. you know? Mm. And, yeah, there's always been this sort of stigma, I guess, around... Um, physics, even at my undergrad, you know, it was 80% male. Mm. I think it's getting better, mm -hmm. um, slowly. Uh, but yeah, I think for myself, I would have just, yeah, given myself the confidence. But mm. I'm, I sort of went with what I wanted to do anyway. And mm. I'm very glad that I did that. Mm. Um, but yeah, in terms of t other people, young people that are looking to do um, physics or any STEM field, mm. I would just say, go for it. Go <laughs> for what you want to do. Mm. Make that your priority. Like if you've got a passion for something, then just pursue it. It doesn't matter mm. whether, um, you know, what most people in the field look like or, uh, you know, what your expectation of a physicist is or anything mm. like that. It just doesn't matter. Just follow your passion. Perfection. What do you think is the most important thing to succeed in academia education? Curiosity. Mm -hmm. I think. So I think, yeah, obviously there are different ways for you to succeed in academia. Mm -hmm. You can be very like focused on writing this paper, writing that paper, mm -hmm. um, getting that published, mm -hmm. networking with this person, mm -hmm. all that kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is all great. And that's a, that's a great you know, line to go down. But I think ultimately, if you're passionate about something, you do do it better. So if you're curious and you really actually want to know the answers to the questions that you're posing, then you're going to work harder. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, for me, it's just don't, don't stop asking the questions, you know, like you were doing when you were a kid, you're asking, you know, why is, mm -hmm. why is the sky blue? Just keep asking the questions and then mm -hmm. uh, I think you'll succeed. Just like a kid. Thank you so like much. It yeah. <laughs> was so lovely to have you. Thank you very much. I hope I can me. come back here after five years and you tell us some of your experiences yeah. and the shocks in academia. By that time, I'm half them. I, I might have some shocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>